Welcome to this Mount Pleasant Baptist Church podcast recorded at our Burgoon campus. We're glad you've joined us and we pray that the Lord will speak to you and encourage you through this message. We are going to look at the life of Jacob, focusing on his MMA match, wrestling match with, with God, right? How would you, have you ever thought about that? Have you, has anyone thought about that? What would it be like to be in the big octagon ring with God and yourself just in that cage? It's one of these uh, passages that you go, hmm, why, why? Well, anyway, our reading, that particular reading is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. Right, And to put this narrative into context, let's have a quick glance at, I'm not going to read it, uh, you can follow it through on the app, church app, the slides are all there, or even through your um, hard copy Bibles, these things, if, you, if we remember these things, hard copy Bibles, these are great, um, or through your devices as well. All right, wherever you got your Bible, you can follow through, and I'll be going through your scripture readings Um, throughout anyway. So um, let's have a quick look at life of Jacob. And it begins in chapter 25 of Genesis, just to put into context of why Jacob is at this place wrestling with this unknown man, right? 25, we're told that Isaac prayed to the Lord and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. And they jostled, they wrestled in the womb, even before they were born. And Rebecca was told that the older will serve the younger. Continuing in chapter 25, we, we know that Esau sold his birthright over a bowl of stew. It was actually kind of deceived by Jacob. And Jacob deceives his father Isaac and receives the blessing which was for Esau. And because he is fearful... Fearful for his life, Jacob flees to his uncle Laban's house, uh, Rebekah's brother. And in chapter 28, Jacob flees, but he rests at a place called Bethel and has a dream, a vision of a stairway to heaven and the angel ascending and descending in that place upon it. And in Genesis 28, 13, 15, God promises Jacob this. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So that's the promise, that's the vision that is planted in Jacob at Bethel. Then he continues and he goes to his uncle's house where he serves his uncle, he marries and he has children and his wealth grows as well. Not only does he marry Leah and Rachel, he also has children through Zilpah and Bilhah as well, and gains wealth through God's blessing. But there's trouble in the household and with Laban's sons. And so Jacob flees Laban as God tells Jacob to go back home. During this time, Laban pursues Jacob, but God intervenes, right? There's something about God covering our backs. Jacob has no idea that this took place, but God intervenes. And Jacob and Laban make a treaty that they won't come across the border, etc. And he finds himself now uh, in today's reading at this river. Like I said, now it's, it's one, of these, one of these narratives where you go, hmm, you know, why did the all-powerful, omnipotent God wrestle with a man? 
Why didn't God just use his power like Thanos, right? Uh, click his finger, right? There you go, Thanos. Click his finger and just do away with his enemy. Or Darth Vader with his death choke, right? Subdue his opposition. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about and who these are, after the service, I will be praying for you down here. <laughs> right? They're the Marvel characters and Star Wars characters. I'll I'll be definitely praying for Pastor Mike because he has no idea who they are. And we've been together for seven years sharing the same office. My goodness. Anyway, why wouldn't God use his power, the omnipotent power, against a man? We'll continue to follow through the text as we go through. And let's unpack this passage and learn from Jacob, one of the fathers of the faith, a man of vision or man with the vision, and how he stays in his faith, how he grows in his faith, because we all want to grow in our faith and to grow to trust in God more and more. So firstly, when we look at this narrative, when we look at Jacob, Jacob communed with God. Last two weeks, we learned that both Abraham and Isaac were men of prayer. For us to begin in our faith journey, to rekindle or to grow in our faith, we need to be, peop- we need to be people of prayer. Our faith begins, reignites and grows in communion with God and especially in prayer, whether in our highs, in our highs with God or in our lows with God, we need to be in prayer and in communion with him, especially in our lows because that's that's the critical time that we don't want to pray. I don't know about you, but when, it, when life gets tough, that's the hardest time I find it difficult to pray and be in presence of God. All of the fathers of faith commune with God in prayer. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we read over and over that they prayed. And we heard last week Isaac was out praying as he waited for his wife-to-be, Rebecca. Even today, we just shared that Isaac prayed for Rebekah to have children. We read in the text, after sending the family across the river. Now, I don't know how you pronounce it. I grew up pronouncing it Yapok, but apparently it's Japok, or whatever way you pronounce it, the river has significance because the meaning of the river means emptying. Jacob was there emptying himself before God. I'll come back to that. So Jacob was left alone and he was praying. He was seeking God in prayer because he was fearful for his life. And we know this because earlier in the chapter 32 in verse 9 to 12, Jacob prays this, save me, save me. I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He was in dire straits, fearful for his life, and there he is alone with God, praying. This man of faith, with the vision, the promise he had received from God, was alone in prayer. When we look to Jesus, the Son of God, he showed us the importance of being alone with the Father. He went to a solitary place and prayed. Time and time again, Jesus was alone with the Father, then how much more do we need to be alone with the Father God? 
For being alone with God is such great benefit to us as we come into a, a revelation of who we are. An anonymous author wrote this, and it's so fitting. To be left alone with God is the only true way of arriving at a just knowledge of ourselves and our ways. We can never get a true estimate of nature and all its actions until we have weighed them in the balances of the sanctuary. And there we may ascertain their real worth, no matter what we may think about ourselves, nor yet what man may think about us. The great question is, what does God think about us and the answer to this question can only be learned when we are left alone away from the world away from self away from all the thoughts reasonings imaginings and emotions of mere nature and alone with God thus and thus alone can we get a correct judgment about ourselves our faith begins and grows as we spend time with God in communion with him in prayer. I'm not saying that we neglect the daily readings of scripture, but spend time with God to also pray the word. Pray the word into our lives. Take scripture, whatever we have read, take it and pray on it. This in turn will help us realize who God is and who we are in him and who God is to us. Secondly, people of faith wrestle with God. Or should I say that God wrestles with people of faith? As we spend more time with God, we begin to wrestle with God. In the narrative, an unknown man wrestles with Jacob and it reads a man wrestled with him till daybreak when the man saw that he could not overpower him he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and as he wrestled with the man as he wrestled with the man then the man said let me go for it is daybreak but Jacob replied I will not let you go unless you bless me I don't know about you, but when I pray, it seems like I do wrestle with God. But in reality, it is God who wrestles with me. In our reading, it doesn't say that Jacob wrestled with God, but the man wrestled with Jacob. The man, Jacob was not wrestling with the man to obtain a blessing. Instead, the man was wrestling with Jacob to help him realize something about himself. In this instance, it was to help Jacob understand of his powerlessness. We learn through Jacob the all-important lesson that when we realize our weakness, there lies our strength. Doesn't it say that for God's power is made perfect in our weakness? See, Jacob, instead of trusting God, he took the matter into his own hands. In his way, for that was the way he actually lived. See, after praying that prayer of save me, Lord, in verse 9 to 12, he divides up his family into two camps and plans to send gifts to Esau. And this is what scripture says. For Jacob thought, right? For Jacob thought, I will pacify him. I will pacify Esau. I will subdue his anger towards me. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. I don't know how many times I've come before God with all the answers, with all my needs and the way to do them. God, you need to do this, you need to do that. I've got these great plans here and great plans there. I've got plans for youth. I've got this and that and everything. And Lord, this is the way we're going to do it. But you know what the amazing thing 
about prayer is this wrestling match with God transforms me. This wrestling match, the grappling with God in prayer actually transforms me. Why didn't God just overpower or overcome Jacob with his omnipotent power? Because he is a patient God who loves and cares for us, who hears our cries and in his perfect timing says, all right, let's work on that now. I have heard you, I know you, I feel your pain, I know your emptiness. Now let's work on that. God is patient and he wrestles. When I approach him, he wrestles with my heart and works in me. And over time, my heart and my prayer are transformed in accordance with his ways, with his thoughts, in accordance with his will. And my, cre- my prayer goes from me, me, me to you, you, you. People of faith, we need to wrestle with God. We need to wrestle with God in prayer that our faith in him may grow. Our Lord in the garden prayed, Abba, Father, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Did he struggle? I think so. Did he wrestle with Father God? I think so. Yet not what I will, but what you will. The transformation happens as we're before God on our knees. He transforms, he touches our heart. Can Jesus empathize with us in our daily struggles? Absolutely. He's been there. He's gone before us. He can can empathize with us. We need to get on our knees and cling on to Jesus. Let's give God the things of this world and cling on to Jesus for he is enough. There is a part that we need to play in all of this and that is to submit ourselves to God. Not only to surrender the things of this world, what I have in my heart, in my mind, but to surrender ourselves in prayer to him and cling on to him and let him work in us. And thirdly, we need to be honest with God. We need to be honest with him in prayer. And true honesty comes in humility. If we are not humble before God, we cannot be honest with God and surrender our all. Look at Jacob. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. For the first time we see Jacob being honest. He had lived up to his name to this point. Jacob, meaning a deceiver, a schemer. He lived up to that name. He deceived his brother Esau. He deceived his father Isaac. And he deceived his uncle as well. Last time he was asked what his name was, was when Isaac was to give his blessing. And Jacob lied about his name. He said, I am Esau. Not once, but twice. God asks him the same question. Who are you? What is your name? But now Jacob humbles himself and is honest with God. My name is Jacob. Jesus too was honest with the Father in his humility. Beautiful passage in Philippians 2. 
Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And here's the reality of it. And as the sins of this world was placed upon him, upon Jesus, your sins, my sins, where we should have been, when it was placed upon him in all honesty and anguish, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did the Father God turn his back on Jesus for this outcry of visceral honesty? Father God didn't turn his back on him, but the blessing came as God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. We too can be honest with God in humility. Our Lord wants us to come to him and bring it to him. The Psalms, how honest is David before God? The lament Psalms, pour them out in prayer to God. God will not turn his back on us. No, he will come and embrace us. And as I come before God in prayer, the true blessing I realize more and more is not what I have received in answer to my prayer, but how I have come to know who Jesus is. For Jesus himself is our blessing. Jesus himself is our blessing. Jesus himself is my blessing. And Jesus showed us the stark reality that the true blessing of God comes as we are honest, as we honestly come before him in humility, to know him and to be known by him. So Jacob received the blessing of a new name, Israel. For those of us in Christ, we too have received a new name. The blessed name of being called a child of God. What a beautiful name to have. I'm a child of God. Who are you? I'm a child of God. To be known, to know him and to be known by him. So let me close with these thoughts as we reflect on growing in our faith and how we trust in God. For us to grow in our faith and trust in God, we need to pursue and experience him. We need to pursue and experience him. And prayer is the foundation of faith, that we commune with him, that we wrestle with God. Wrestle with God. Bring everything before him in humble honesty. And Jacob had the vision of the promise of what was yet to come. For us, the vision of the promise has come and was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He is our vision and he is our all. Our faith, as Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. For us, faith is a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. For it is with Jesus that we commune. It it is with Jesus that we wrestle with. And it is to Jesus that we can be honest with. For he has gone before us and he knows and he can empathize with us. We do not have blind faith and wishful hope, but we have faith in the person of Jesus and the hope is in his promises. How great is that? 
How great is that? For Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's pursue him on our knees. And as we come to communion, let's spend some time reflecting. Now, Paul reminded us that we should examine ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let me, allow me to pray this devotion of Spurgeon as a time of reflection before we take communion. And I think it's quite fitting and fits in well with what we have shared. Spurgeon took Leviticus 6.13, where God commanded, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I want to encourage you to close your eyes and let me read this and just, just meditate on the words that are coming to you. Leviticus 6.13, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go Go out. Keep the altar of private prayer burning. This is the very life of all piety. The sanctuary and family altars borrow their fires here. Therefore, let this burn well. Secret devotion is the very essence, evidence, and barometer of vital and experimental religion. Burn here the fat of your sacrifices. Let your closet season be, if possible, regular, frequent, and undisturbed. If actual prayer availeth much, have you nothing to pray for? Let us suggest the church, the ministry, your own soul, your children, your relations, your neighbors, your country, and the cause of God and truth throughout the world. Let us examine ourselves on this important matter. Do we engage with lukewarmness in private devotion? Is the fire of devotion burning dimly in our hearts? Do the chariot wheels drag heavily? If so, let us be alarmed at this sign of decay. Let us go with weeping and ask for the spirit of grace and of supplication. Let us set apart special seasons for extraordinary prayer. For if this fire should be smothered beneath the ash ashes of the worldly conformity, it will dim the fire on the family altar and lessen our influence both in the church and in the world. The text will also apply to the altar of the heart. This is a golden altar indeed. God loves to see the heart of his people glowing towards himself. Let us give to God our hearts all blazing with love and seek his grace that the fire may never be quenched for it will not burn if the Lord does not keep it burning. Many foes will attempt to extinguish it but if the unseen hand behind the wall pour thereon the sacred oil it will blaze higher and higher. Let us use text of scripture as fuel for our heart's fire. They are live coals. Let us attend sermons, but above all, let us be much alone with Jesus. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And it is in his death, that he has paved the way for us to be in communion with God. When you're ready, please take the elements. Let me just close in prayer. Beautiful Jesus, we thank you so much 
for your love for us, your mercy and grace, but you dying for us, that we may be in fellowship with the Holy One. Lord, help us to each day be present before you, just to be in your presence, to commune with you, to wrestle with you, but to bring all the things that we have on our hearts in humility and with honesty. And we know that you won't turn your back on us. You will lovingly care for us, and lovingly look after us, but you will gently touch us that we will cling on to you even more and more. You are a blessed Father. And where will we be without Jesus? So we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. We would love to hear from you. If you would like prayer, please submit a prayer request at mounties.org.au forward slash prayer or send an email to communications at mounties.org.au and one of our team will be in contact. Have a great week.